welcome everybody. Uh, so I will first ask uh, our panelists to present themselves very shortly with some, uh, maybe uh, tell us uh, what, uh, what business is your company doing and the, the main KPIs uh, that you find interesting for our, our uh, audience. Is it okay? Uh, we'll start with uh, Teddy. Hi, so my name is Teddy. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Itch. So we'll start with the baby beach. Yeah, nice joke. <laughs> Good one. Uh, so uh, what we are doing, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we created an app which uh, connects uh, passengers and drivers in order to share a ride at night. So it helps uh, young people to go out and to move around uh, in their city. Um, so we are open only between 8 p.m. and uh, 6 a.m. And 80% uh, of our passengers are under 25 75% uh, of our rides uh, happen on uh, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday evening, and 70% of, our, of uh, our rides uh, happen uh, in the suburbs. So it's something uh, between carpooling and between private driver in order to create a new uh, mobility solution for young people uh, at night. Uh, yeah, <laughs> then Paula, maybe. So hi there, I'm Paulin, I'm the founder uh, of Drivey. Uh, so Drivey is an app that lets you rent one of the hundreds of cars uh, that are parked around you. Uh, and it doesn't really feel like a rental because you have no waiting in an agency, no queuing, no paperwork, basically no hassle. Uh, and the way we do that is we operate a marketplace where we let uh, car owners who, who own uh, an idle car to rent it out on the platform to make money and, and basically help, help their neighbors. Um, so, the, so we were founded five years ago. Today we have around 35,000 cars in France where we started, also in Spain and Germany. And we have close to a million uh, users. We are doubling the, the activity every year. Uh, and our vision is really that uh, within a few years it will be all about on-demand cars rather than car ownership and that we are freeing people uh, with, a, with a much better service than uh, ownership. And so let's finish with uh, Verena from Blablacar. Thank you. Um, so Blablacar is, um, is a platform that allows passengers to connect with drivers heading the same way. Uh, today we have over 30 million members in 22 countries. To give you an idea of what that means in terms of, of travelers, uh, every month or every quarter we have uh, around 12 million people who travel uh, every quarter. That's about four times the traffic of the Eurostar. So we're now really turning into a, a real infrastructure, um, a flexible infrastructure by optimizing one of the biggest idle capacity there is. Um, which is empty car seats on um, city-to-city -city journeys, so on long-distance travel. Okay, th thank you very much for, for this presentation. Um, I, I, I'm a bit older than the each customers, but uh, I, I'm a very good customer for BlaBlaCar and, e and Drivey. Uh, my question was, uh, in, um, your, your business models allow new way of traveling for uh, your um, uh, people who want to go from, from a place to another. Um, do you know if your customers are the same? Uh, are they, um, I, I, are you um, taking advantages one, on these three companies from, from the other's existence? So, for car rental, our average uh, order is 100 euros for uh, a little less than 100 for 3.5 days. Uh, so, and, and our av average age is, uh, is around 35 years old. So our customers are typically young urban actives, people who already have a job because when you are a student, you, you, don't, you really find a way uh, to get a car for free or for cheaper. Uh, so we, we don't really cater with the, like the, 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 the youngest part and the students uh, is, all, is a bit uh, marginal just because it's a, it's a high uh, spending. 
Uh, but definitely, we, and, and, and we definitely have uh, a lot of people coming from BlaBlaCar who was there ahead of us, obviously. So we had a lot of our early adopters, especially on the supply side. So people who rent out their cars who said, okay, I trust you because I've already been with another platform. It works. They are trustworthy. And so I'll, I'll, I'll very, I'm very happy to do the same uh, with, uh, with Drivey. So, so, of course, the, the, the purchasing power thing makes the age a bit different, but I think in the long term, it's all about, like, do you make... Is there a point in your life where you start buying a car? And I think this is going to disappear, so people will use all of these services increasingly together. Yeah, um, I think I totally agree with what you just said, and we actually just finished um, a, a study on the effects uh, well, actually, on, on how you build trust on platforms like, uh, like ours. Uh, we're about to publish it next week, and one of the conclusions is that there are positive spillover effects from one platform to the next, because as people get familiar with the trust tools um, uh, that, are, that exist on such platforms so that it allows to really unlock the sharing potential because people become peers that they can trust and they can start collaborating together, as they do that on one platform, they get more inclined to do it on other platforms as well. And you have a sort of learning experience that, bene that is beneficial for the entire sharing economy. So that I completely concur with what you've just said. That's totally what we're finding out as well. Yes, uh, I, I agree, obviously. So um, I think, yes, uh, uh, Paulin and I are taking advantage of uh, BlaBlaCar because uh, everyone is on BlaBlaCar. So of course, we have some people in common. Uh, our users are pretty young, 20 years old, uh, 20 years old on average. Um, but of course, because uh, BlaBlaCar sh shows that it's possible to share a ride on a long distance trip, it's a bit easier for us to explain, okay, you can do, it, you can do the same at night, even if the, the model is slightly different. So I guess it's helping us to have someone, uh, uh, well, uh, a company as strong as BlaBlaCar in, in, in France, of course, yes. Okay. Um, your, your companies uh, started with a few customers, of course, uh, but uh, they are growing very quickly. Uh, from what I heard, uh, BlaBlaCar is like 5% of the uh, market of the SNCF, the French National Railway. Uh, I heard that some years ago. Uh, is your customer changing? I, I ask this question mainly to you, Verena, because uh, BlaBlaCar is 10 years old, which is quite old for a startup, but uh, yeah. still a startup. So uh, wha what do you see in this uh, dynamic and uh, long yeah. middle term experience? I think uh, wha what's interesting and, and makes it fun um, working at Blah Blah Car is that every time you launch in a new country, you're starting from zero again. And every time we we're sort of seeing the same uh, phenomenon, which is that the young people are the early adopters. They are the ones who are more connected, who are ready to try something new. And then... As time goes by, you become more mainstream. Um, and uh, if, you, if you take a market like France, which obviously is, is very developed, but that's also the case actually uh, across most of Europe, uh, we only have about under a third of our members who are students now. It's, uh, it's I would even say, under, under a quarter. So now it's mostly uh, working professionals. Um, the average age is around 35 years old. We have about a third of our members who are above 35. So as you become mainstream, your average um, user really uh, also well is more is more representative of society as a whole. Okay, and so uh, uh, when BlaBlaCar started, there was no smartphone, almost. So it was something quite uh, unusual. Nowadays, is uh, people are are using the uh, w w uh, which um, device is the main yeah. used for for your application? For each, I guess it's only the smartphone, but uh, I I don't. Imagine you uh, no. <laughs> exist, but... Uh, yes, well, to answer the first question, of course, we are a bit younger. We started in 2013. But uh, when we started, we had uh, only uh, students on the platform. And now we uh, can see that there is a new community, and it's people uh, living in the suburbs. And uh, they are not necessarily students, but they can't uh, move around at night because they don't have uh, any solution. So now we have uh, mainly students and young people, but we start to have... Uh, uh, another community, and uh, yeah, of course, people are using. Uh, well, the app is available on uh, iOS or uh, Android, so people are using smartphones. So. I, I actually think for us that co th that made a huge difference. The first five years of BlaBlaCar were was actually a 
quite a fight to get the first million of members it took five years. Um, and I think w the development of um, the model was really in line with the development of, of connect mobility um, and uh, mobile phone, I mean, connections. And now uh, about, I think, 60% of our booking are done on mobile. And um, it's really uh, mobile first, the way that we now pre choose to present also our product. So we as a company and as a product have really evolved um, together with the developments of mobile connectivity. Yeah, and in our case, uh, so what we could see in the beginning, most people were quite enthusiastic with the concept, but you still had a lot of really time poor people who were saying, well, you know, driving, I, I like your idea, but it's not really for me. I don't have time to compare, contact five or 10 cars, uh, email people back and forth and everything. And that's really what we are focusing on, like trying to make it more simple, more on demand, more immediate. So you really have this challenge in, in those platforms of having an unreliable supply, not a professional supply, and, and being able to deliver uh, a very reliable service that you can book immediately. And that's very challenging technically because when you, ha when you buy your own supply and you own it, you can organize it so that you provide a good service. And in our case, we, we have to, with a fickle supply that you don't really know if their calendar is up to date or not, you have to provide a good service. So we have innovated a lot and that has enabled us to increasingly um, uh, be successful with the people who don't have time, who are not like enthusiastic, especially about the sharing economy, just want good quality of service, good convenience. And it's more important probably in Germany and the UK than in France, for example, where the people are more just love just the fact to, to be sharing. Um, so the transformation in the product has enabled us to progressively conquer these new type of people who are active, really time poor, uh, and, and don't want to, are not uh, uh, ready to compromise with the time they spent uh, doing a booking, for example. Okay. Um, so what's, uh, uh, what's interesting with this panel is that you, the, the three of you, you, you build like a, a whole system and uh, in mobility it's uh, um, essential to, 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 to think uh, the, the project as a system. And so my question is that, um, uh, so uh, infrastructure projects, they take usually more than five years uh, in the very, very efficient projects to become realities for, for travelers. For example, if you speak about the Grand Paris Express, the new uh, subway lines that will go around Paris, uh, we are talking about them uh, for like uh, five, more than five years and they will be there in like uh, three to four, five, six. Um, so uh, what does your respective growth uh, means for the traditional mobility players and their main project to come. Do you think that, for example, if we think about uh, Notre Dame des Landes, this uh, airport uh, that was uh, sought uh, in the 60s and that is not built yet, <laughs> uh, for, so for, for nowadays, do, do you, when do you think the, 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 the engineer in the SNCF or the big, big uh, state uh, national structure will think of you as a part of the system? Um, well, I, uh, that's, I think the long-term view is definitely that we can, all of us here, allow enough optimization that, that it reduces the need for additional infrastructure because we're also alleviating the burden that we have on the environment and just making the whole thing more efficient. So that's the long-term objectives. I think we're still, um, even though we're trying to grow as fast as we can, we're still very small in the big equation of, of transport and infrastructure. Um, but I'd like to refer to what um, Arun Sundararajan, whom you, I think doesn't need any introduction, but is a professor uh, at NYU Stern and a specialist of the sharing economy, and he calls that invisible infrastructure, or the type of services that platforms offer. Um, and he was giving an, an example of how Airbnb, during the Rio Olympics, would allow to uh, suddenly for additional capacity to be offered when there the demand goes up and when the demand goes down there's no loss because it's a it's a capacity that's available 
um, if it's needed. And he was also using the example of Blablacar during the, the uh, is, uh, Icelandic volcano, which name I forgot, but as everyone was blocked, suddenly there was this additional supply that could come in to address the emergence of an immediate need. Um, and so that's the magic of these agile models which we offer, is that they're here if they're needed, and there's so much room for optimization. So this invisible infrastructure in the meantime uh, is, is already providing a lot, and hopefully one day it, we can also rethink infrastructure more globally. Um. I think there is a big question, uh, and it's a bit maybe uh, political, of rail against road. Uh, I mean, before being in this whole world, I was very much in favor of big rail projects, tramways in the cities, for example. And I think what we are seeing today with the explosion of artificial intelligence, algorithm, and everything, the optimization capacity for the road transportation is much higher than for the rail. Like, if you put supercomputers to optimize SNCF trains, you probably can get a 5%, you know, traffic so that the trains cross better and leave at the right time, but it's maybe 5%. The optimization, thanks to artificial intelligence and, uh, and all the progress in the computing capacity for the road, is probably 500% improvement in the efficiency of the road. So I was typically uh, very much in favor of big infrastructure pro progress. And if, if you think ahead of time what's going to happen for transportation, if you, if you imagine that fleets of minibuses, real-time routed, electric, uh, self-driving, secure, will be all around the main uh, large cities in the world and pick up passengers real-time and readapt the routes, uh, and, and if you think about how all these services are going to combine, I think it seriously questions the, 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 the investment we should put in road versus uh, rail, especially autonomous cars is, is going to change everything. And, and, and the fact, the mixture of better driving, better uh, engines with electric that doesn't pollute, and, and, and pulling passengers, the mix of that is, is a tremendous uh, improvement. So, so I definitely think that we should reconsider the way uh, countries invest in, in very expensive infrastructure. But, uh, uh, in fact, what you're saying is that the, the, the car was something very inefficient from the very beginning. Uh, when you listen, it's, uh, it's parked like 95% uh, of the time with only one person when it's able, uh, able to transport four. And uh, so it's, it's because of this inefficient from the beginning that you have this uh, huge progress uh, uh, possible to, to reach very quickly. But uh, I, have w what, uh, I would have uh, one question also for uh, uh, Blablacar, maybe, because uh, you are uh, worldwide now. And Verena, when we talked together to prepare this debate, you told me that the culture uh, background was very important every time you... Uh, you go in another country. Can you give us some example to to imagine what it is to to, to travel with Blablacar when you're not in Europe or in a developed country? Yeah, um, as I was saying earlier, I think the challenge is everywhere that we go, we try to be relevant to a local need. We like to say that we are a global company, and actually the way we're organized very much reflects that. So. Um, we have very strong local management teams um, and the global teams, the headquarters are actually support teams, but uh, the, local, the local teams are more like entrepreneurs who, are, who know their, their country well and who address the local needs well. Um, and I think every time it's a question of, of starting from scratch, of developing a new usage, a new behavioral shift, um, and w what's interesting to note is that in certain countries there are some um, actual cultural fits that, that make that perhaps even more relevant. Um, we, would, we were discussing, uh, well, for example, in, in Russia there is a culture um, of when, when you're in a city of actually stopping any car and, and sharing a ride. And in a way, um, Blah Blah Car is making it, well, easier because you can now organize it via your your cell phone, more secure, more reliable, uh, but it's, so it's, it's sort of 
making an experience which is already part of their culture even better. Um, we were discussing earlier on an example uh, in Turkey, where we are as well, um, in, in Turkey. Um, typically, you have this also this culture of sharing, where if you go in a, in a coffee place and you buy a coffee, you're actually going to buy two and leave one in case somebody wants a coffee that same day and can't afford it. There, so there's this culture of, of sharing, of, of friendship, of solidarity, um, that actually, oh, yeah, from one country to the next, you might find both in terms, obviously, of the more sort of grounded economic rationale, but also in terms of the, of the cultural fit, that, that there are different reasons um, uh, to, yeah, that can make the, the, the proposal one that is appealing. Okay. And so what you say is like mobility is life, actually. And, uh, and especially now in the 21st century. And um, so w you, you, you talk about that, um, uh, Pauline, but with, uh, w what, uh, how do you, the three of you, see the autonomous car? Uh, let's get started with the point that it's allowed, that uh, you, can, uh, you can go in the street and take an autonomous car, or you can buy it. Or wh what do you think it will mean for your uh, company uh, business models? Is it a threat, an opportunity? Is it uh, too far to... We, you are three startups, so the, the next three months are more important than the next five years. But <laughs> Yeah, it's difficult to imagine what's going to happen because uh, we are only uh, two, uh, two years old, so I don't know. I think the main topic is going to be the regulation. So, uh, of course, if we assume that it's going to be allowed from, uh, from like in one year or so, uh, it's going to change everything, but uh, maybe we are not ready to uh, to allow uh, autonomous car yet. And uh, then, of course, uh, the main factor is, well, people won't need uh, to own a car anymore, except if they want and they enjoy uh, buying a car, but otherwise the price is going to be really decreased. Uh, it's going to yeah, decrease quite a lot, uh, actually. So then uh, maybe it's going to be cheaper to uh, order a car than take the bus or something like that, so it's going to change everything, yeah. I guess, I don't know. Um, so so I, I, I think it's, so autonomous cars will definitely uh, be a, an ownership killer. I don't think people will own uh, cars anymore. Um, and, and, and I think that that's one of the reasons why some experts anticipate that it is going to take a lot of time because they imagine that we will replace fleets of hundreds of millions of privately owned cars with the same but autonomous, and I think it's not happening at all. The, these cars will come to, f to platforms like ours and serve the people on demand, so, so the, the adoption will be much faster. So for us, the fact that it's, it's going to kill ownership and, and allow on demand is a huge market booster for us, so it's a huge opportunity. Uh, the first cars that will be listed on Drivey Autonomous, for example, uh, it, it resolves a lot of questions around trust because uh, if you let your car but the guy doesn't, if, even if he's a bad driver anyway, doesn't get to drive. Uh, so so it's, it's going to be super... Uh, so so we, we anticipate that people will have fleets, small fleets of autonomous vehicles and list them on Drivey. Then the big threat is that all our businesses are going to be the same, actually. So whether it's Uber, BlaBlaCar, Hitch, Drivey, and all these guys, we, you can have one platform that serves all the needs, regardless of it's in inner city or outer city, regardless if it's one hour, 15 minutes or 15 days. Uh, so uh, <laughs> there needs to be some uh, discussions between the actors, I believe. Okay. Uh, I suggest that we can take some, like, two to four questions in the public. One here in the front. Yeah, since we're talking about growing pains, I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, with each of your platforms, what, what is most more of a challenge, to find drivers or to find customers, or in your case, cars or customers? Well, uh, it depends, actually. At the, begini at the beginning, it was uh, kind of easy to find uh, drivers. It was a bit uh, harder to uh, find passengers. So we were uh, in nightclubs. I think our first uh, night was at the Cabaret Sauvage, actually. So we were there, and we were... Uh, speaking about the product to, uh, to uh, future passengers, uh, and they were using the service. Uh, right now, it's a bit the same. I mean, the both communities are growing, so it's okay. Uh, but of course, when you are growing, you have uh, other challenges. Uh, we uh, face a tough uh, regulation, so I guess right now it's the main challenge. 
and uh, tough competition, of course, uh, with uh, Uber and some other, uh, other actors. So I guess right now it's not about the community, it's mostly about the regulation and the competition. Um, yeah, I think for us, as I was saying, is just having to restart in every country always from, from scratch um, and changing the behaviors and proving your case and creating the, that initial liquidity that ignites, uh, that spurs the viral growth because people see it work. And it's, I think it's less a question of driver or passenger, but more a question of both of them being on the segment where they're looking for each other. So enough of them being there. And, and yeah, so... It's uh, it just it, it re reinventing the, the wheel each time, which is sometimes a bit of a different wheel, different d depending on where we go. And in our case, it, it's definitely more supply constraint in the beginning, and then it, it, it gets more balanced, and we have to manage seasonality. So it's driving bookings are very strong in the summer, very strong on weekends, less so in other times. So so the, 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 the bottleneck changes all the time and it's actually hard to figure out you know, when you should do what, uh, but we put a lot of intelligence into that. Hello, um, I am Bastien, I am a, a Belgian journalist and I have a question for uh, Paulin de Monton. Um, you have developed uh, Drive you Open, your new service, uh, with Drive you Open, I can rent a car uh, next to me without uh, the presence of the owner with my smartphone. Um, the goal of this new service is to compete um, as a traditional uh, company, car sharing company like Zipcar. Well, the, the goal is not, I mean, you never make a goal in terms of competition. The goal is to, to offer more flexibility to the users. So, so for example, if you are booking seven days of holidays, a few days in advance, you are happy to meet the person, to take your time and everything. Then you, if, you are, if you want to escape Paris for just uh, half a day uh, to go walking in Fontainebleau, then you are happy to, to have a super fast booking process. So, so it's really to reduce, reduce the friction and, and make it more flexible so that even if you are caught in traffic jam, you don't need to change the appointment and everything. So that's really the, the objective. And then definitely, yes, of course, it's obviously closer to the Zipcar uh, model. Two, two more questions. Okay. Short oh, questions okay. and short answers. <laughs> yeah, wait, otherwise wait, the break will be very short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm now running the company, like a blah, blah, blah in Japan, and the biggest one I, I running. And uh, so, to improve our service, I want to ask to Blablaka, uh, how should we keep the safety in the car, in the travel? Um, well, what, what we do is to ensure the uh, strongest elements of trust prior for you to actually meet the driver and passengers you're going to be with so that you choose who you're traveling with. Um, and then that's, I mean, as a, as a platform of intermediation, you can control or you can at least have an influence um, over the tools that the passengers and drivers have to choose who they're going to travel with. And that's where we post, put our biggest efforts. Um, there's only so much you can do once people are in a car, um, I think, other than perhaps certain applications such as, for example, uh, maybe map applications where you can track where people are at a certain time, um, or uh, what we're doing also, is, as, you, as you might know, we have a partnership with AXA so that we provide some insurance in case, uh, some additional insurance, because as you, as you all know, when you're ride sharing, you are insured by your insurance company, but um, when we offer additional free insurance for specific cases. So these are the type of things we can do to help, to support, to reduce the risk. Uh, but then, of course, we're not in the car, so we can go only uh, as far as, um, as, as these examples show. Here are the, the, okay. the, the last one and super quick, otherwise. Yeah, last one. Okay, thank you. My name is Egbert. I'm from Berlin. And I have a question concerning your expansions, expansion strategy. So in two, two um, ways. The horizontal one is, at, if you think at Uber, for example, Uber is just calling them themselves Uber. And in Germany, for example, it um, is adapting its model 
to the laws, so it's called UberX, Uber Pop, whatever. It means that they offer ride sharing, car sharing, so all the um, mobility platform related jobs like you three are offering. So one question is, are you, um, is there an option that you are cooperating with each other? And the other question is, what is your um, expansion strategy concerning um, Europe or concerning um, other countries? Is it just China and um, US or how do you go for, for Europe, for example? Yeah, I think Uber uh, ha Uber has to adapt uh, his model because uh, regulation is very different uh, uh, in in several countries, especially in Europe. I guess it's not the case for uh, driving and blah blah car because their model can be uh, everywhere. Uh, it's the case for us. So uh, first we selected the the countries where where our model is uh, is well accepted. So we opened in uh, in Poland and, Sw and Sweden. And uh, then, of course, maybe we will take a look at the regulation in uh, in other countries, and we will ha we will adapt uh, what we are doing because our mission is uh, is more about uh, helping young people to move around at night, and then we have to best uh, to find the best solution in each city. And sometimes it's going to be with uh, our model, our French model. Sometimes it's going to be with a different model. Uh, okay, so I think. Uh Time is, uh, is over for this uh, debate. Thank you very much. We'll see that the, the future will be different from what we imagined uh, from the beginning. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, your, all the work done by your teams because uh, it's a team that does everything possible. So thank you very much. <laughs>